Welcome, everyone. The song is called You Are Welcome Here, and you are welcome here. So there you have it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nicole. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Unity of Boulder. We want to welcome everyone who's here in person in our, in our sanctuary right now and everyone online. Thank you so much for joining us. We love having you all here. It makes our day every Sunday. Um, I've got a few quick announcements. 
Cintisha has a women's book group starting this February 4th. That's this Thursday. It's going to run for five weeks. They're reading a book called Wild Edge of Sorrow by Francis Weller. We have the book in the store. Right, we, We've got them in this week. It's 25 bucks to register for the class and $10 per class. Um, it goes from 6 to 7.30. So uh, if you're interested, sign up in, uh, in the bookstore or you can call us on the phone. You can sign up online. And that starts this week. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Oh, this Saturday, or no, starts uh, Thursday, February 4th. Uh, this Saturday, we have um, our 52 Moves Nia class that we do every so often. It's kind of a beginner for, if, uh, for our Nia dance that we have here throughout the week. Uh, if you've ever been interested in trying out Nia but have been a little scared because you've never done it before, this is a beginner intro class. Everyone's invited to come. It's $25. It's this Saturday from 10 till noon. Um, and it'll be right over here in the Fellowship Hall led by our good friend uh, Rebecca Hartman. And last but not least, this Wednesday, due to the fact that Jack and Norma are out of town visiting family, Sintisha will be leading the Wednesday meditation that we have every week at 7 p.m. So if you haven't come out for that in a while, come check it out. Sintisha's got her own little flair of the way she likes to do it. Um, so please come check it out. That is all. Enjoy the service.
thank you. Thank you, Nicole and band. It's a wonderful way to start. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all here. Welcome, everyone that's joining us on live stream. I'm going to read you a little excerpt from the book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, um, which I'm starting that woman's group next, next week. Not this week, but the next week. Um, it's a little story that will lead us, lead me into this sermon. Um, so it, this is the writing from Francis Weller, and this is what he says. I remember vividly my experience in Maladoma. I felt pangs of envy when every night near dusk, people would gather in the common area and share their day. This is when we have happy hour in our culture, drinks at half price. Perhaps this is how we anesthetize our loss. In Dino, there was food and millet beer, stories, laughter, and tears. It was thick with a feeling of welcome. Children were there as well, weaving in and out of conversations, playing until they lay down and drifted into sleep, filled with the sounds of their families and community, which lapped in their ears like waves on a beach. They were not segregated from the world of the adults. If a child was hungry and was nursing, any mother with milk offered her breast to the child. It took me days to figure out who exactly was the child of whom. Imagine how profoundly that would impact us if we knew if we knew that we were welcome in any home and could find sustenance at any fire. This has a lasting effect on the psyche. The children I met were generally happy, engaged, and curious, and they displayed a certain confidence. They knew they were a welcomed part of the village. It was clear to me that what we long for and what we need is the fulfillment of this primary satisfaction, these primary satisfactions. This nightly ritual was in stark contrast to Western culture. We tend to spend our nights separated from one another. Our storyteller is the television or the internet, and children are hustled off to bed to follow some regimented idea of bedtime. After all, they have schedules to follow. We often go entire days with only the bear's connection with one another, with the earth, with ourselves. We are busy people. What I felt in the people of Dano was a, t a deep sense that they knew their worth and their welcome. These two things are extensions of one another, worth and welcome. There wasn't any anxiety of whether someone was good enough to be let inside the circle. This was a given. And don't hear this as some altruistic practice. The generation of healthy and contented people was a necessity for the sustainability of the village. Everyone was needed. Therefore, their well-being was essential. A healthy village requires healthy individuals, and to become a healthy individual, you need a healthy village. They are mirrors of one another, the one supporting the other. I bring this up because um, I was raised by a mother that did not feel good enough or lovable enough. And it came from a childhood with sisters. She was in a trio where the three of them performed on TV and radio. And there was a set up of being in competition with each other. And her older sister and her younger sister were both Leos, which are very strong, set fire signs. And she was this soft-feeling Capricorn. And so she felt very bullied from both sides of, of her sisters. And it built a sense of lack of worthiness and self-love. And being raised by a mother like that was a really powerful teacher because her entire life as she raised us kids was to make us the most loved, like to feel the most loved, the most confident, you know, homeschooling and art and everything was so thought about because she was so damaged from her childhood, she wanted to raise children that were not damaged, which we, you know, we're, we're better off than she was, but we all have damage because life still damages you. But as far as what she gave to our lives, it was really, really powerful. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but I want to read this from Love Without Conditions. How you view life depends on whether you feel lovable or unlovable, worthy or unworthy. Either way, you will create an external situation which reinforces your opinion of yourself. All preoccupation with supply comes from living in the past. 
Lack is simply the remembrance of old wounds. These are too easily projected into the future. To end scarcity thinking, you must forgive the past. Whatever it has been no longer matters. It no longer has effect because you have released it. Yesterday, um, we had a memorial here for my very close friend from my childhood that I was friends with since I was five years old. And she's more of like a family member than a friend. It was somebody that literally was an extension of my being. And I'm in a pretty rocked place today, so I'm gonna be very, very careful with myself because my, my system is like in shock today. Like, um, I had donated the church for her memorial, but made it clear I did not want to perform it because it was too, too close for me. And I was making a boundary for myself to love myself enough to be able to bask in the reverence of the loss of my friend. I very rarely get to sit in a church and just listen to a message, and I really needed that yesterday. Well, they'd hired a minister to come and do the, the memorial, but didn't articulate themselves well enough, and they, this minister came and just thought that you were gonna say two things, and there was no minister for her service. So two minutes before her service, I was thrown into performing my friend's memorial yesterday, which literally shocked my nervous system. Like, I'm literally like shaky today. I just like can't seem to calm my system down, so I'm just giving you that heads up right now that I'm speaking here, because Jack is not here, but if he was here, he would be taking over today for me. <laughs> But I'm talking on eliminate, eliminating scarcity thinking and how we see ourselves because of my relationship with Maya and the hardships she went through from not coming in this world with a sense of self-love. And in the end, I do believe is why she ended up dying of cancer in the end because she could not find that love for herself. And I spent a good part of my life trying to help her get that. And, and the one thing I've learned through life is that you can't teach anybody. You can't lead somebody to self-love. That that's a relationship between you and God. And it's a really important thing that we have to acquire on this spiritual path. Because my friend was a very religious woman. She was of service to this community and oversaw feeding thousands of people every month. And out of just the love of her heart, she was a beautiful human being that touched people constantly, but could never receive the love from all the people that loved her. And when she was unfortunately dying, um, I visited her a lot, and when I first went to her, the first time I went to visit her when we finally now knew this, that the battle was now coming to a close, she got really honest with people and told them how she felt about them. And she said something that stuck out so much to me and has shattered me to my core <laughs> and is growing me in a powerful way. Um, she said that I picked on her too much when we were little, that I poked at her a lot. And I did, because um, I was raised by a mom that didn't show her like vulnerability. She was a New Yorker, so was my dad. They both were New Yorkers, and they had a very sarcastic way of communicating, even though they were trying to do the best they can, that's who they were. So I acquired that form of communication. So picking and poking and being silly with somebody isn't necessarily silly to someone that has a really soft kind of a broken inner child. So I was part of the problem and I didn't know that until two months ago. And of course, you know, I, I said I was sorry and I told her, you know, I, I was 13 and 14 years old. I mean, I, I, I'm a different person at this phase of my life. I can't even recognize myself as that person. Um, but I had my come up, and so as I got older, I had to learn a new way to communicate in my life in order to cultivate loving relationships and things like that. And of course, she forgave me. 
But you can imagine if one of your best friends tells you that you're part of the reason why they didn't feel good about themselves, considering the work that I do, and what is the topic that I always talk about? Self-love. I have stuff to do, right? I have growing to do. I have forgiveness for myself that I have to do. Um, and I'm just talking on this because this has been something that I've witnessed in my life. I counsel a lot of people that have a lack of self-love, and I have areas where I have a lack of self-love too. You know, I, by nature, am a really guilt-ridden person. I always feel like I'm not doing enough for everybody. It's just something I have in me. You know, I walk around. So when she told me that, I've been like lifeless in guilt and shame and in self-reflection and trying to find other areas that are unhealed around guilt and shame and what that's been creating in my life that has been a limiting experience. Can anybody relate with this? Like when somebody calls you out, right? And then how do we like cork that hole? Because <laughs> it ain't corked today, I can tell you that. But then I'm in the situation where you know, I've been battling this inner upset for since she passed away a month ago. And I'm not going to do the, the memorial. I woke up yesterday stressed, just am I going to get up to that open mic and say a few words? And then I was thrown onto this platform to do what I didn't feel capable of doing. And I did a perfectly great job because God did it through me, but now the human body is like in shaky land, right? The nervous system is affected. So I want to talk when we feel stuck, like when we can't move through our emotions, like the, the childhood wounding, right? So I'm raised by a mom that felt broken and unloved, and I've been singing with my mom since, I've been singing with my mom all my life, but actually like performing together since my early 20s. And my mom is a nervous performer because of that, that kind of bullying between these two sisters that were Leos and had more self-confidence. She has this like feeling like everybody's gonna serve me better on the sound system than, she, than her. Like there was just this like competition thing with me a little bit, but it wasn't necessarily it was me, it's anybody that she performs with, but I was her daughter. So it would be hurtful for her to have this kind of visual like I would be in, competition with my mom singing. And she also had this hang up that the sound guy was out to get her. No matter where we performed, she was sure the sound guy was out to get her and that her mic wouldn't be turned on or something was gonna happen. And, and God willing, it always happened. Something happened to her microphone everywhere we performed for years until we like really got to the core of what this issue is. Because in this slide, it's saying how you view life depends on whether you feel lovable or unlovable, worthy or unworthy. Either way, you will create an external situation which reinforces your opinion of yourself. And I've literally seen that in direct contrast of watching my mother, right? I have a really funny story about this. You know, she was always sure, and, and my poor sound guy, he's been with her long enough to know that He's had moments where she's lost it and been really upset because somehow my mic sounded better, or whatever. So this one night, and Larry's been performing with her and I forever on our CDs and all that stuff. I'm not putting my mom down here because she's amazing. But we all have brokenness in us, and I do too, obviously, you know. Um, but this one night we were doing a set song here at the church. We used to do chanting services where we actually did like an hour and a half of chanting. And it was a very popular thing that we did here back in the day. And we had a rehearsal where we practiced all the numbers for an hour. And at that time, we used microphones like this, but it was like on the floor. So it wasn't connected to our bodies like this. And we were both sitting on our, our meditation pillows. We practiced for an hour. It's a perfect sound check. We're perfectly great. We go, we leave, we get water and all that, and then we get back when the crowd is here. And we sit down to start chanting. And all the accompaniment starts and all that stuff. And the second we're about to start singing, 
This is her mic in front of her right here. We're just about to start singing. It starts going like this. All the way to the crowd. Then it falls like this. And then the microphone fell out and fell down the stairs. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like God is super funny. Like super funny. Okay, I hope I didn't just screw up somebody's music thing in a minute. But I just had to give you the visual, right? And you all know that I'm quick to laughter. My nature, I laugh at inappropriate times. I laugh a lot. Like, that's definitely my healer. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I am like hysterically laughing. Then Larry's laughing. We're all like, even the drummer can't even keep up because it's the visual was so instantaneous of this self-loathing. And that's what I grew up with Maya, too. She believed that she wasn't worthy. She didn't believe that she was, was uh, like, important to the community. Like, that story right there. Like, everybody knew they were needed in that tribe. So everybody was treated as equal. And even though Maya and I were both raised going to the Waldorf School, you know, we learned how to crochet and how to whittle wood and make shoes from scratch and do our little home books, all written in cursive. And it's all these ways to develop a brain that's healthy and happy. But even within that school, she had bullying going on with many students. Because again, somewhere she didn't feel lovable or worthy. And when I went to visit her, a time after she told me that I had been a part of the problem, my daughter's dad, Arenya's dad, went and visited after I had just been there. And he called me after his visit, which was like a few hours after I went, which I was like dead inside, just staring into the abyss. And he called me from the side of the road in this heartbroken, I am the problem. Maya's dying because of me. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, like she gave him a whole earful of how he wasn't good enough and how I wasn't good enough. So there's a reflection here of what she felt too, right? Like no awareness that we were all kids. Nobody wanted to hurt her. But in that self-reality of not loving herself enough, she acquired a lot of mirroring that she wasn't enough. And I talk about it because I feel like more people feel that way than not. I, I think, you know, I've had this, I've done talks like this before, and I always say it because, I mean, I've, I've felt that way so much in my life, and I said to Mike one day, you know, I, do you ever like feel a sense like you're not worthy or you're not good enough? He's like, no, I've never felt that way. And it shows in Mike. He's the happiest person. Things just roll right off his feathers. He's just like a duck, just rolls right off, right? I might be like, you know, with communication with Mike, I may, you know, we'll have moments where I'm like, I mean, if you really, like, think about our marriage and we, like, talk about, like, this deeper, like, issue and, like, how come you don't get, like, the emotion that goes with, like, that, you know, I'll try to, like, have this really deep conversation <laughs> with Mike. And I'll say, why don't you get that? And he's like, because you married this guy. <laughs> what, did you expect him to be something different than what you dated? Right? We do that. We think we're going to turn them into, like, being some philosopher. He wasn't. I married the happy guy. And I always love that answer, because you married this guy. Like, I'm not going to be something different than what I already love about myself. Isn't that a great affirmation? I'm not going to change for you. I like myself. I love myself. So I'm not going to change this God being, God moving through me, exactly in the way that God moves through me. But if we feel stuck, and we feel like we've tried everything to move through these lower, limited thoughts about ourselves, we have to start 
communing with spirit because spirit knows that we're made in the image and likeness of God. Spirit made us that way. We come from a knowledge and a wholeness of perfection. But the world is the one that will reflect to us what needs to be worked on. And if you're constantly getting an affirmation about something that you are really insecure about inside, then that's the universe showing you there's some deeper work to be done here. There's some affirmations to be done here. Like for instance, with my mom, all those years we've been singing together, which is 20 something, I've loved her through it. I mean, I fought with her more when I was younger, it would annoy me. But when I really got that all she needed to see was that I was on her team. I, we're in this together. These beautiful songs that have come through us, these angelic spiritual songs, are a karmic, beautiful thing. And yet we're bickering before we perform because you have fear. Somebody made you feel fearful about sharing this beauty that's in you. Can anybody relate with that? Being cut so we do not express all of these beautiful things about ourselves because someone told us that we were less than perfect. Who was that person that said you were less than perfect and you believed it? That's the, that's the hardest part because you believed it because you already felt that way about yourself originally. Nobody can say to you that you're something and have it hurt you unless you already believe that about yourself. So we have to start looking for signs and symbols. Channel writing, have you ever, when you're trying to move through something, because a lot of my counseling lately is people feeling stuck and they don't know how to navigate to move forward right now. Because of COVID, because of isolation, because of careers changing, because of relationships changing, because everything falling away that you were attached to, you just kind of feel butt naked here. How do I get my motivation to start anew? Like get this engine going and not go back to our old limited thoughts that say that you can't now reinvent the life you've always wanted. Like, if this is a huge opportunity for us to now acquire a blissful experience, a loving experience, a peaceful experience, a freeing experience, an exciting experience. Because in the newness, we're, we're moving forward in a positive way. But because things have fallen away, we do have things that are being unearthed that we are healing. And that's a good thing. Obviously, this thing with Maya was a really big one that I needed to be with. It made me realize I have so many friends that live in Steamboat, live in Denver, live in, we've all moved to different places. They live in Colorado, but they live in, far away, way enough places, but they don't live in New York, they don't live in California, but we haven't seen each other for five years. There's just no excuse for that. Like people that matter as much as Maya matters to me. So what this did when she said that to me was, wait a second, she's right. I am not cultivating my friendships and showing them how much I love them because I don't know if I'm gonna have them all tomorrow. You know that lesson that we learn when we lose people that we freaking love more than life itself? We don't know if we have anybody tomorrow. And if you knew that about all these people that you love, wouldn't you do something differently? You'd pick up that phone call and call them and tell them, and I've been doing that and that's felt so good. I've heard where they're at, the careers that have changed, the relationships that changed, what's happening with their children, all those things. We just always thought we had, once our kids are grown, we'll all get back together and hang out. There was kind of this like illusion like this and all of our careers became more important. No, it's not more important. This tribe that built you and grew you and you know are your family members from the soul level 
need to be nurtured. And this someday where we're going to be back together might not exist. If there's anything I want to get across today, is to really look at who matters. And do whatever you can to communicate with them and to see them. Wear your mask, but go see them. So something is awakening in all of us. The universe is asking for an awakening. And asking empowered questions is a really good way to start figuring out how to move forward and to discover this awakening. What is awakening in me? I'm becoming more fully aware that I need to show my friends more about how much I'm secretly loving them. Why am I secretly loving them when I can just pick up the phone call and call them? Why am I feeling all these wonderful things about people and I'm not showing them? So that I wouldn't be in this position where I am with Maya, where our lives got too busy and we weren't around each other enough. So empowering questions. What is trying to emerge in my life? What is my gift to share? What is my purpose? Why am I here on this planet? Because so many people are going through pain right now. We all are. It's a tough time. And by asking these questions, you start looking for the signs and the symbols of the universe sharing with you. How to navigate, when it's a good time, when it's not a good time, to move forward. Angel cards. Has anybody ever played with angel cards? Those are really a great way to ask questions and then read what that card says. Last week, on Thursday, I was driving on St. Brain Road, which is, there's a lot of bald eagles on that road, and I just love it, and I drive it a lot, because my, um, when you live in Lyons, you do all your grocery store shopping in Longmont, so you're on that road a lot. Anywho, I was driving along to go pick up my kids in Longmont, and I saw these two bald eagles just right next to each other. I mean, they were touching, you know? And they were so beautiful, and I was like hoping that they'd still be there after I picked up my kids and came back, because I was pretty close to where I was picking them up. Them up. And when we got back, oh, they were gone. They weren't sitting there, but then I looked out at this other tree, and it looked like the same thing, but like in a tree much further. So I pulled off, and we were looking at them, and Kathy goes, why are you so obsessed with bald eagles? We see them every day. And I said, do you understand how special it is that we live in a place where we see bald eagles every day? They are like one of the most powerful symbols for God. They see the world from above. They see the vastness of what is needed. They're a power animal, and if we're seeing them every day, we're doing something right. And I, drive, I start driving along, and we're driving along, and out of nowhere, I have never had a bald eagle do this in my life, it literally just turned into a sore right in front of my car. It looked like it was seven feet wide. The wingspan went like this in front of my car. And what I had just said to Kati said, we, might, we must be doing something right. Because they're the sign and symbol that we're doing something right. Where, you know, I've been walking around dragging myself like, I suck. And the universe said, no, you don't. I needed that message. No, you're really good, actually. You are really good. You just made some mistakes. And we all make mistakes. But we have to find that forgiveness in ourselves if we're going to become anew. This thing cut me hard enough for me to really be with it to help me move into the expansion of this next phase of my life so that I can be even greater and more compassionate and more loving and more beautiful. So when we look at the hard things that are happening as a total gift because something is being birthed here, something is emerging. 
Your good isn't being taken away from you. It's getting, it's, it's getting away from you right now so that you can open up to bigger and greater beauty. Bigger and greater love. When you ask an empowered question like, Father, Mother, God, will you please take this burden from me? And know that God's taking it because you have faith. As small as a mustard seed is all you need. That faith of knowing it's already taken care of and saying thank you when you ask the universe to take that burden from you. So you may be open to seeing your life again so that it's not the only thing in your focal point, this burden. Or take this disease from me. Take this abusive person from me. Take this uncomfortable job from me and I know you'll give me the right job. Open up your vision after you give it the burden to God. God wants to take it from you. What is a burden that you can come up with today that you would like to give to God? And you can call it out. Control? Say it again. Worry and anxiety. Fear. What would others think, right? Like that self-approval. I, yep. Why do we care what others think? As long as we like and love who we are. It's none of their business why we like and love ourselves so much. But if we have a direct connection with spirit, source, God, whatever you use as a word that makes you feel loved and makes you feel merged with this greater power, anything can be taken from you that no longer serves you. I wish Maya could have gotten that before she left because I couldn't do it for her. We can't do it for anybody. No matter how much compliments, no matter how much stroking, no matter how, it only comes from here. And then we, we find ourselves healed of illnesses. We find ourselves healed in our marriages. We find ourselves healed in our relationships with our children and our parents and our sisters and our brothers and beyond and beyond and beyond. When I commune with God and you commune with God, then we commune together. When we can finally be authentic and honest enough about the things that no longer serve us, they leave our life. Guilt is not serving me. Feeling guilty that I'm not doing enough, being enough, somewhere that comes from some insecurity in me, and I don't know where that comes from, but I don't need it anymore, God. I don't want to feel guilty that I'm not enough. I'm not coming up to stuff enough. I'm sick of being my own bully, bullying myself that I'm not enough, so I'm always striving to prove that I'm enough, and I'm exhausted. Can anybody relate with that? <laughs> now we got a response. Now everybody's a little awake. Did anyone ever take communion in church and find it empty? But then you sit in this sanctuary and feel what true communion is? This is why church or spiritual centers or communities are so important. We don't even have to know each other's names, but we're sitting here in the consciousness of God together. Praying in numbers is powerful work. Being around mirrors of ourselves that are love and peace and healing and kindness and support. 
so that we can go out into the world and mirror peace, love, kindness, support, so we all can help each other heal and narrow this divide that we're seeing in the world. Greeting each other, participating in each other's unfoldment. And I understand we're so glad you're joining us on live stream. But make sure once you feel safe and you're ready, we're wearing masks here. We're sitting six feet apart. We're being careful. We miss the vibration of each other, don't we? We need more of it. God never makes mistakes. We just don't believe that God is as powerful as God is. We also don't believe that we're as powerful as we are because we are the vessel for God's wisdom through us. So if you believe that God is as powerful as taking your burden, healing you, bringing the, the relief or whatever it is that you're searching for, then you also have to start speaking to the power that is you, in you, expressed as you, as perfection. Matt Kahn wrote um, a, a wonderful thing that somebody sent me through an email about um, the blocks towards unfoldment at this time, this feeling like it's hard to move forward. And this is something that he wrote, and I found it really helpful. My friend um, Felicia sent it to me. Going without the very things you desire most is often a direct entry point to returning to the wholeness within yourself. So we've all experienced this. I'm going to read that again because this is the most important part of this. Going without the very things you desire most is often a direct entry point to returning to the wholeness within you. Do you get that, right? So we've all had a lot of our desires fall to the side here. But what Matt Kahn is saying is by that happening, it's bringing our focus in. It's taking us and returning us to our wholeness because what it's doing is those desires are falling away and we're left with self. And that could be self-hatred or that could be self-love, which means we're going to be growing that wholeness within ourselves. This is the insight the universe already knows. Once you know it too, you will no longer blame yourself for why things are exactly the way they are right now. Throughout this process, remember that things are always in a state of change and can only change for the better. Do you see that change right there? Everything's in a state of change, but it can only get better. That's affirming that we're now done with the hardest part of this because things are changing for the better. Just that affirmation, I'm so grateful, God, that things are changing for the better. No matter how they are being perceived, things are always changing, though not necessarily at the rate of your insistence. We all know that, right? But as a result of the unthinkable perfection of divine timing, this reveals one of the most pivotal insights of universal co-creation, in most instances, you don't need a different, different experience, but a different attitude and more loving approach to the circumstances underway. I'm going to leave it there. I love you all so much. We'll take an offering for unity. <laughs> And while we're um, getting ready 
to hear some more beautiful music by Nicole. I hope I didn't mess with your microphone as in my demonstration. Oh, okay. Oh, well, see, that was me reminding you you didn't have your mic. See how the universe works? Do you see that? I'm, you know, I'm just going to remind you that uh, being that we operate in the world, as Jack always says, I, um, the tithing is what keeps this place open, and the inspiration, and the musicians, and the, all the beauty that you experience here. So if you feel obliged, um, please give kindly, and you know, more than you probably pay for your coffee would be helpful. So we'll take our offerings in our hands, and we'll bless it with this offering statement. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive because I give. Okay. The song is called I'm Ready by Tracy Chapman. It's off of her uh, New Beginnings album, and it's my prayer for this new year. <sighs> Is that a problem?
I'm ready to, Nicole. <laughs> Aren't we all ready to let the river wash over us? That's a great affirmation for us all to live and leave and, and hold this week. All right, well, Jack and Norma will be back next Sunday for the first service, um, and I'll be doing the meditation service this Wednesday if you want to come and join me at 7, I think. Is it at 7? All right, let's all rise and close with our closing benediction. available to you if you want to if you stay seated they will come and find you they're wearing the white cloaks um, and they'll take you down to our beautiful meditation room and pray with you thank you for coming